Welcome to Vision Chats, where the only thing that matters is the future. I am Farouk Day, Vice Provost at Johns Hopkins University, and I'm excited to be broadcasting today from a very special building uh, here at Johns Hopkins. It's the George Peabody Library of the Sheridan Libraries and Museums at Johns Hopkins University. Did you know that it first opened its doors in 1878? And yes, it does look, have a little bit of a, uh, uh, the, 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 the movies look that, uh, that, that you could see. I, I love just being in this building. There are more than 300,000 volumes dating from the Renaissance through the 19th century. And of course, its mission is to teach and research, a teaching and research collection, exhibits and uh, public programming. It's here in Mount Vernon in Baltimore. It's absolutely my favorite building. Uh, it's close to the public now because of uh, the pandemic, but when it reopens, I hope that any of you around the country or the world, when you visit our beautiful city in Baltimore, that you will get the chance to connect with us. Uh, we have a very special vision chats today. You know, I often talk about students in these vision chats. So today I decided I wanna talk with students and I have amazing guests who are joining us today. Let me tell you a little bit about them. Shade Jackson. Hi, Shade. How are you? Hi, I'm good. How are you? Joining us. I'm doing great. Shade, you are a student in sports management at Community College of Baltimore County. You have interest in arts and design and photography and film. Um, you've been in participating in entrepreneurship things and caps and projects since a young age, thanks to your mom. Hi, mom, if you're watching. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you uh, uh, are, uh, you, you also started uh, in a startup early on that uh, continues to live. It's called Crown Your Inspiration, and you've done a lot about it. And it, you can read about it if you just Google it. <laughs> There have been articles, et cetera. So thanks for joining us, Shade. We're, we're happy to have you here. Uh, we have Amber Merritt, who uh, you are an opera singer and a performance, uh, a voice performance uh, student at the University of Michigan. Um, uh, welcome to, uh, we're so excited to have you here and uh, I've enjoyed learning about you. You just finished your master's degree, Amber, and now you're just completing your, your specialist. Look her up. Uh, online. You can even hear her saying she's amazing. So welcome. How are you, Amber? I'm great. I'm happy to be here with you all. I can't wait to get into the conversation with you. Um, and then we have Alex Shackney, who uh, uh, is finishing his undergraduate studies at Johns Hopkins University. Hi, Alex. How are you? Hey, I'm good. I'm happy to be here. Awesome. Well, Alex, I got to know you since your freshman year four years ago, and now you're about to graduate this year at Johns Hopkins with a degree in computer science. You are a former basketball player here on our team. Um, also, I learned that you are a little bit of a musician, an acapella singer, and you do all sorts of other things, and you're working on your startup right now. It's called Paths. You uh, tell us a little bit about it, um, but I know that you have, uh, you have strong interest in startups and in entrepreneurship. So i um, excited to get into the conversation. So listen, Alex, Amber, and Shade, you know, I, uh, I teach life design here at Johns Hopkins and life design is anything that is not about planning. So what we teach here at Hopkins is um, that we don't ask people to tell us what they are going to do to be when they grow up. Uh, that's also a question that I try not to ask my own children. <laughs> um, we don't ask people, what are you going to do with that major? We don't ask people to, have to produce plans for their lives and their careers. But instead, we want to have them identify their areas of curiosity and then to act on them, to take a little bit of risk and to try them out um, and to uh, connect with people who can help them, you know, find mentors uh, who help them out. I would love to start there with you. Um, what has been your own area of curiosity and how, how have you been, how have you been able to give it breathing room, give it air, allow it to, to live? Um, so I'll start with any of you who, um, um, who is inspired by that question. Um, I think my own curiosity started when I did find opera in the seventh grade. It, well, it found me rather, because I never knew that I was going to be an opera singer at that point. And I realized when I looked around and I looked in audiences that there weren't a lot of people that looked like me. And I was curious about how I could get 
more people involved, more African-American youth involved in opera? How can I make that cool for the next generation? Because I, I want all of us to enjoy this culture that I've come to know. And so I think that, you know, from there, I started reading different books, just picking up different books. I'm like, how can I inspire the next generation if I myself am not inspired? So I'm like, okay, I have to find my own curiosity, as you said. So I'm reading books about, I'm reading the power of habit. How can I discipline myself? How can I find that my three Ds are drive, determination, and discipline? And those are the three things that I say that if I can have within me, that I will be successful. And so I think it really started with opera for me in the arts. That's awesome, um, Amber. Oh, go ahead, Kelly. Okay. Um, so I think, honestly, I'm not sure where my curiosity started <laughs> because I'm into so many things. Um, as far as art, um, I taught myself how to draw when I was like five. Um, so like just from that point, I just been into art. Um, I didn't have many art classes, but I always seen art everywhere from mm -hmm. the um, like the paintings on the streets. Um, I see so many more than now in the murals on mm -hmm. um, all of the buildings in Baltimore City. Um, Amber, I'm, I'm sure you've seen them. Yes, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, going to Artscape, um, which is a really big thing. Um, Afram, like I was just saying it all and I'm just like, how do you make this happen? Like, this is, right. this is amazing. This is great. Um, but as far as like the sports part and photography, like my little brother plays so many sports, like basketball, track, football, and everything is back to back. And so, like, I always see, like, people taking pictures and I seen film and everything. And I'm like, that looks pretty cool until, like, my curiosity, I feel like my curiosity came when I started trying to learn on my own and, like, really trying to develop and see. But the thing about what makes that challenging is that you have no help when you're learning on your own. Mm -hmm. So, like, you don't have, like, anybody to fall back on or depend upon or ask questions, especially when it's not in your field. And mm -hmm. a, a lot of the people that I've networked with weren't necessarily in my field. They were more like, you know, doctors or lawyers or um, marketing or anything under that area. And internships, a lot of internships that I did weren't really in that field. So it was harder trying to, like, really learn and develop. Um, and another thing is that, that why it's challenging is because when you challenge yourself to try to be better, you also put more weight and pressure on yourself. So I was putting like a lot of more weight and pressure trying to say like, I have to have a say in this, I have to be here and not understanding that, you know, it's okay to take time, um, and learn the process rather than trying to rush in it because the beauty is all in the process. It's, you know, of course the finish line is great, but as you go through, that's where all the beauty is because that's your story right in that center. Yeah. Yeah, very cool. Um, <clears throat> it's interesting. I mean, where does my curiosity come from? Or, or uh, you know, like I think both of you guys, um, I have had a lot of different interests my entire life. Um, you know, I've sang, I've sang choirs my whole life. Um, uh, but I've also been an athlete my whole life. And, uh, you know, growing up, I played pretty much every sport out there, uh, basketball, soccer. Um, I did wrestling. I tried everything, really. Um, but uh, and that's kind of been a common theme of my life is I've tried a, a ton of different things. And uh, eventually I got to a point where, um, you know, in high school, I had to pick, you know, which one, which thing did I re really want to hone in on. Um, and that for me was basketball. And so, uh, I really kind of went deep, got, you know, that was my first like real obsession. Um, and, uh, and was lucky enough to get recruited to play basketball at Hopkins and kind of then went through another cycle of getting curious. And so when I got to Hopkins, uh, you know, I said yes to a lot, I, you know, like I was saying to Amber, I joined acapella, um, Farouk and I met and uh, and kind of nurtured my entrepreneurship interest. And we we actually started a, a nonprofit together, uh, Life Hacks, which turned into Imagine X, which um, was its own journey in itself. Um, and, and, you know, I've always been a humanities person, but I, I in a STEM environment at Hopkins, I ended up majoring in computer science um, and, uh, you know, a variety of other things that, that I took on. So, um, Again, I kind of got to this point where I had to consolidate those interests into one into one thing, and I think that's a common uh, theme in my life of 
you know, getting curious and just trying a, a bunch of different things. I've never really lacked a curiosity. Um, I think that's, that's always been constant, but um, the hard part is then actually choosing the one thing and saying no to the others. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, it's, it's been a constant uh, prototyping, you know, ideating, uh, uh, getting curious and then prototyping experience for me, um, which I know Farouk is intimately familiar with in the, uh, you know, that's the life design process really. You know, Alex, I kind of wanted to piggyback off of you before you spoke um, for, uh, you know, that's kind of like the beauty of it all. Like when curiosity is feeling like you have a limit on something and you're like, mm -hmm. okay, how do I surpass this? You yeah. know? And so like with you was like, you had to choose, like, am I going to do this or am I going to do this? And so because maybe because like you had to choose basketball, now you're at a point where, okay, I can do more than this. So what's the next step? So it's always like, it's not what's the next best thing is what's my next passion going to be. And like, I'm actually yeah. struggling with that too, because like, I'm like, how am I supposed to mix being an artist and photography? And I have like all these skills, but what's the one that's like, I'm most passionate about what has my, all of my curiosity that can lead me to something greater, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, what has been, I just want I'm curious, like what, uh, you know, like, where do you put most of your time right now? Or like, how do you, how do you strike that balance right now? Um, it between your, you know, between photography, art, um, your own entrepreneurial ventures. So, you know, it's funny because I actually started learning how to mix it just a little bit. Um, mm. So at my school, they don't, they hadn't, I had seen that they hadn't posted a picture for the men's basketball team since 2016, which I thought was crazy. Also, you know, COVID happened, so that kind of took some things off. Um, but I'm like, I want to do sports photography, so why not start with my school and build um, my portfolio? So, like, I've been doing their um, their graphics, um, but I've also been taking their photos. So I've learned how to, like, create an even balance between editing and also making graphics. The only time I do graphics is for my school. Outside of that, with sports photography, I only edit pictures. So the hard part is um, time management is a really big thing because I also have homework. Um, right. Most of the games are in the evening. So usually most of my homework would get done in the evening. Um, right. a, lot of, a lot more games have been done on the weekend. Um, mm -hmm. So I think my, the most of my time goes into, I would say, photography and editing. I should be saying school. But... Um, <laughs> photography and editing because you know I feel like if it's something I'm passionate about I can make time to I can make time to make it work you know so mm -hmm. completing what I have to get done versus um completing what I have to get done versus like having a main focus on what I want to do so have completing school having my school work done and then after all of that is done um, and using the calendar as well, because I wasn't using one at first until I started doing photography. <laughs> um, but after after I complete my schoolwork, then I immediately go into doing photography, sending pictures out um, and doing the editing and just creating new concepts because it's it's a lot. But when you like doing something, you don't really worry about how much time it takes. Yeah. Right, right, right. And I think you realize like, you know, as an entrepreneur, you're going to you're going to have to sacrifice a lot of things now for the return you want later. Yeah. You know, and that's that's how I kind of view it. You know, that I'm just going to work hard in, in so many areas as I can. Because I'm also taking an audio engineering course because I want to be an audio engineer because why not? So it's like, OK, I'm an opera singer from 10 to 2, an R&B singer from 3 to 5. Uh, an exercise enthusiast from six to seven, a holistic wow. medicine person from eight to nine <laughs> and in the studio for the rest of the night, you know? Yeah. So it's like, you just put on your different hats and I don't think you have to choose. I think uh, people will tell you that you have to choose um, a specific thing. Um, but I guess you could say, okay, my specific thing is opera, you know? Mm -hmm. But it's like, I also, like you said, you choose the what to do with your time. You know, I tell people, yes, I'm an opera singer, but I know the many different hats that I'm juggling, you know, at one time. And I, and I don't want to choose. I don't think I have to. <laughs> no, that's awesome. If you can integrate everything, that's, uh, I think that's the ideal. It is. Yeah. I, 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 I want to know about the scary parts of this, you know, like everything that the three of you are sharing is, 
sounds uh, sounds very genuine and true, but also like the, the glamorized part of this mm-hmm. that, you know, like it's sort of uh, try things out because that's that's the whole life design journey is get curious, try things out, connect. Don't worry about what it'll turn out. Be be comfortable with, with the uncertainty. But tell me about the demons that come around <laughs> when things quiet down and give you those doubts. And how do you deal with that? And where do they come from? And what's your support system? What's going on during the those times, the dark moments? Um, I love to speak first on this because I experience this a lot. Um, I think the dark moments is just thinking about failure um, and feeling like what's going to happen if I don't complete this. Or have an understanding, like, you know, Alex, like, you know, I've been doing basketball my entire life. So if I stop doing it here, you know, am I like, am I not successful? Have I not like, you know, made it here in this point? Like, is nobody going to appreciate me or take on my journey because I've decided to change areas? And like, that's, that's where like, you know, the pain comes in because, you know, because I wanted to do fashion design. But then I'm like, I don't want to do it anymore. I want to do photography because I love the emotion and everything it captures. But having the thought, like, are people still going to support me, though? And it's kind of like, you know, social media. Like, when you're on there and, you know, everybody knows you for doing this, but then you change and everybody was like, I'm, I'm not really feeling that. So it's like, it's like you have to steer away from what other people have thoughts of you versus understanding that this is what I want to do and if you accept it you accept it and if you don't then oh whoa this is this is my passion but Mm -hmm. the the pain and the darkness comes when it's a lot of times it's at night because um like you're just overthinking because you know you have all this on your plate you feel like you're doing good but it's always that one thought that comes and it's just like are you really doing good like are you really taking the time out to do what you want to do like is this really where you want to be right now? You know, is everybody really supporting you like they say they are? You know, you don't really have no help because you're doing it all on your own, you know, and every time you call somebody, they're not always there, but you're always there for everybody else. So then, you know, it's just all these mumble jumble dots um, coming into your head. But for me, I'm a spiritual person. So I take time out. I'm just like, I talk to God. I'm just like, listen, OG, these thoughts is kind of like, they beating me up, but... (laughs) I'm not just going to like fall submissive to it. You know, I'm not going to let, you know, these demons and these spirits like just come over me because it's just like, you want me to fail, but really I'm just like, those dots are here for a short time, not a long time, you know? So <laughs> that feel like that's where it falls at for me. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. I feel like that inner saboteur is really strong for me. She's, she's always there uh, right next to me, every opportunity. Um, but I stopped listening to her because I'm like, okay, and because, you know, you build a resume. It's like, okay, my inner saboteur said that I wasn't going to be able to do this and I did it and excelled. So it's like you have to start feeding yourself that logic, right? Because what you tell yourself most of the time is actually not very logical. And, you know, I just did this PBS gig and it's like, you know, that's the biggest thing I've done this far. And I'm still sitting here thinking like, did they choose the right person? Are they sure? You know, and you know, this is somebody who I'm sure knows talent when he hears it, you know, but I'm still questioning myself even in that very moment. But I was like, you know what? I'm, I'm not going to allow myself to live there. I'm going to allow myself to live in truth. As, as you kind of said, Shadi, you know, God tells you the truth about yourself. It's kind of what you're saying. And so I'm just going to tell myself the truth. And the truth is, is that I'm prepared. I'm talented. I'm smart. I'm going to tell myself the truth and not all those other things that try to come in. And I'm sure for you, Alex, like performing and doing different things that happens for you too. I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. I'd say, I mean, um, <clears throat> yeah, the, the, the other side of it uh, is, I mean, well, let's take like, for example, the, the saying no, right. The saying yes is very, it's nice. It's easy. You know, like we talked about it. Um it's cool when, you know, you're spinning, you, well, you know, it's cool when you, you, the initially you, you say yes to all these things and, um, and you feel excited and then you have to grapple with like, okay, well, how am I actually gonna do all these things? Um, and, uh, and how am I going to do them? Well, you know, like you commit to, um, when you, so, so what I guess I've learned is I've been much more careful on what I'm committing to. I mean, I think you can do a lot of things, um, at once. Uh, but if you're trying to really like, um, 
kill it at one thing. You got to give it its space and it's make it a, that priority like all the time. Um, but part of that is like my journeys of having to say no to things like, like you said, uh, Sade, like, it, it, I, you know, not playing basketball this year was one of the toughest decisions I've ever made. Um, and uh, the reason I did it was because I've been trying to spin the plate of being a student, uh, an athlete and uh, an entrepreneur for three years. And at some point the rubber hits the road and you, you got to say like, well, what am I actually, you, you know, what am I committing to, to uh, mastering? And, um, and so that's, ob- I mean, the amount of hard conversations I had this summer was, uh, you know, a lot. There was a ton of hard conversations, teammates, coaches, parents, et cetera. Um, but, uh, and then at the end of the day, it's, it's also taking the accountability for the, uh, the journey, whatever, whichever journey you do choose, uh, and all the ups and downs that come, come with it, you know, like, um, I've been, uh, I was telling Farouk, uh, so I've been working on this startup, um, this new one called paths for the past, you know, uh, really eight months, uh, without any tangible, um, you know, results. And, and part of that is that I, um, I've chosen to do it alone. I've been coding the whole thing alone and building it all uh, alone. Uh, and, um, it's been tough, you know, it's been tough, but at the same time, like, uh, what's pushed me through is just the belief in it's the product itself, the, mm-hmm. the actual making progress on a day to day. Um, and, uh, you, you know, like just, just having, being able to kind of step back, um, and, and create the bigger vision for myself and, and, um, kind of map out, you know, like start at the end, right? Like you, you start where you want to be and then you, you kind of backtrack on how you're going to get there. And, um, and yeah, through, through the, the hard times, it's like, you just kind of, you got to keep going. I don't know what keep, what keeps me, what keeps me going. It's, um, well, actually there's a quote. I don't know if you guys listen. So as a basketball player, as an athlete, I'd listen to these like, uh, motivational videos, right? There's a quote from Eric Thomas. I don't know if you guys know him. Um, he's awesome, right? The quote is, um, uh, you know, basically you're already in pain, like get a reward from it. You know, it, it kind of it, like, don't cry to quit, cry to keep going. It's kind of the, uh, uh, and listen, like knowing when to quit is also really important too. But um, it's, uh, I think one of the most important things is like just sticking with something um, and realizing I'm early in the process. You know, it's been eight months, but like, it's still early in the process. Um, a lot of times startups are 10 year overnight successes. So it, uh, uh, you know, that's kind of the the, na- the narrative in my head as, I, as I'm going through it. Yeah. So one more thing, um, because it's some people asking questions in the chat. Um, that I wanted to piggyback off of. Um, I feel like another thing where darkness may come in for some of us is saying that the people who we thought were going to be there drop off. Mm-hmm. So it's like, you know, we have to, the people who are around us weren't building us up. And so we were starting to notice it. And, you know, when you confront that person about it, then they kind of make it about them. And so you're just like, okay, you're just going to have to go. Like no love loss, you know, no, you know, big bang or no big trauma going on between us but it's the fact that like you know when people aren't at the level that you need them to be like where if they're not reaching where you are then you know sad to say you're gonna have to let them go because the more that you let negativity feed on you the more that you have negative thoughts coming on to you so a lot of, through high school early for me I had to drop a lot of people off because I'm like you know, high school, you may not have it figured out, but you have an understanding that some people you just can't keep in your circle for forever because either they're going to bring you down or they're going to help lift you up. Right. And it's important to know, you know, the gift and the and the vision was given to you. Mm-hmm. So when you explain it to somebody else, it's not going to make sense. Exactly. Because it, yeah. it was. Yeah. So I think that's important to know is that it is a role that you're going to have to go alone. And that's mm-hmm. daunting. But it's also very rewarding, um, you know, and knowing that it's, it's individual for each of yep. us, you know, it's not going to look the same as anybody else. And so when you explain that to them, sometimes you have to give people grace and just knowing that you don't get it and you're not mm-hmm. really supposed to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I want to answer uh, Maya asked in the chat if there's pressure uh, from society to pick one thing. And um, 
I would say definitely, you know, the whole, and this is what life design is kind of the antithesis of, but you come in and you're supposed to pick a major and that major is supposed to determine where you get a job. And then basically you're resigned to that job for the rest of your life. And um, that's the, uh, that's the big lie of career planning. Right. And, and Farouk has, um, you know, really, he's really introduced life design at Hopkins, um, which is predicated on the two, the two statistics, the real facts that, um, what is it as a student today, you're going to have like around six different careers, uh, in your life. Um, and, uh, and it's like, I think 78% of students don't go on to work in what they majored in. Um, and so, uh, kind of the traditional, you know, pick a major, go specialize, uh, I think has really been challenged recently. And there's a great book called range. Um, and it's why generalists thrive in a specialized world uh, by David Epstein and talks a lot about why, um, you know, sampling or trying a lot of different things uh, early on um, tends to have better outcomes than specializing early. Um, And, you know, he goes through examples in in medicine, um, in uh, in the life stories of, you know, uh, Vincent Van Gogh and and a ton of other uh, kind of really windy paths and life stories uh, that were completely non-conventional, non-linear. Um, and uh, I think that that is, yeah, it's really consistent with life design. Um, so I don't know, I, I, I want to ask kind of Amber and uh, and Sade, like, do you guys, you know, what pressures have you felt uh, in pursuing your own, you know, tracks? Yeah, um, I think as an opera singer, people have expected me just to only do opera. And most opera singers, I think, are getting out of that now, but for a long time, because that's why I think when I was an undergrad and um, I had different hairstyles and I didn't look like an opera singer, you wouldn't know, you know, um, I didn't have that look. And, you know, I had a teacher tell me um, I have a dress code in my studio, basically telling me you can't look like that here. And, um, you know, I took that in strides (laughs) and I just like this is how I'm going to show up as me, as my authentic self. So there's always that pressure around what does an opera singer look like? And certainly for a long time, she didn't look like me. And she certainly wasn't on stage as African-American woman singing opera. So I think that's new in itself, you know, really creating that space for African-American people and for people to realize that we're here and we're in this space now. Um, And I think, you know, society does pressure us to choose one thing, but I'm kind of, in my case, I'm glad it did. I was all over the place. I needed a focus, and but that focus, allowed me to branch off to find the other things, but I established discipline in one thing. You have to establish discipline. It doesn't matter where, okay? Like if it's an exercise, you'll notice if you establish discipline and exercise, which I've done, that starts to cascade into other areas of your life. So sometimes choosing one thing isn't a bad thing. I'm just going to focus on this thing because we're only human. We only have a certain amount of hours in the day. And so, okay, I'm going to seize this. This is what I'm doing today. Sometimes focusing is a very good thing because then you're able to, to broaden that once you've established that discipline, at least in, in my case. Woo. Yeah. Um, Take it. You said a lie. <laughs> Blown away. Blown away. <laughs> So I, 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 I just want to add real quick before shot. I definitely want to let you uh, answer, but it reminded me in the book range. Um, I think uh, one of the biggest points was that like um, uh, a large percentage of um, Nobel laureates, people who have won Nobel prizes, uh, they have that focus in their area, but they also, I think um, most of them had some sort of hobby some sort of other, uh, you know, kind of release that gave them a different perspective, whether it was music, whether it's photography, drawing, uh, et cetera, um, that they were able to uh, escape to and also use as a kind of uh, different sounding board for um, inspiration and other ideas. Um, And so I totally resonate with that. Um, But Sade, I'd love to hear uh, what you were thinking. Um, Like I was saying, Amber said a lot. Uh, it's a lot to piggyback off of because you spoke some true facts. But one thing I noticed about um, society and, you know, like social media and everything, they kind of fall together because people create these ideal, these fake ideal realities of what life is supposed to be because they see influencers doing those things. So people kind of have been building their lives off of influencers and, you know, Every day I see an ad post now that Instagram is changing so much about 
this influencer says that you should do this, or this influencer says that this is how you're going to get rich within the next few years, or this influencer says that this is how you can take your talents to the next level. It's all of these crazy ads. So people tend to focus, make their focus, like you were saying, Amber, on that one thing, but their one thing is influencers because they're showing them the materialistic things. This is where you could be. You're working the nine to five, so you're not really doing that good. And like, you know, all of this crazy stuff. And so I had to learn that, you know, society, the hard part is that you have to take your mindset out of what society wants you to be or what society wants you to do. Because if you don't, then you're just falling under it. Like, it's like a spell, you know, a spell casting everybody. Like, you have to be in this one chair. And if you don't, then you're going to die, basically. And <laughs> it probably sounds bad saying, like, but that's exactly how it is. And so, like, I thought that if I wasn't doing whatever society wanted me to do, then I wasn't getting nowhere. And like I say, I talked to God and he was just like, I didn't give you your gift that I gave you wasn't what society is expecting. So because I gave you something different, you have to act different. You have to move different. So like that comes with taking a break from social media, deleting it off your phone, you know, like saying that, okay, if this is what I'm going to focus on, I need to pinpoint this. I need to sit in my chair, if I got to sit here all night and say, okay, how am I going to make this work? How am I going to focus on this? What can this branch off to? Like you were saying, Amber, like art was my, art was my main focus. I'm like, okay, I can do this. Like doing graphic design and starting crime inspiration. I was adapting all types of different programs and creating all these different, you know, designs and everything. But then I seen that, okay, I know how to make graphic design. But then I also seen that, oh, I know how to take my own pictures too. So you see, like, you know, everything branches off of one thing because you had your focus, like Amber was saying. So now it's not that you don't have the one focus anymore, but you have different branches that you can pour into. You know what I'm saying? So it's it's the fact that, like, people have to learn how to say, OK, society is over here, but God said I got to be over here. So bye bye. You know, like how Damien Lillard be um, Alex, if you watch, he's like, bye bye. I'll see you later. <laughs> so it's kind of like, you know, like, OK, bye bye. I, you got to go like I, my focus isn't on you my focus is here and it may not be you know the straight and narrow path how y'all portray it to be but it's going to get me the, to the place that I need to be uh -huh. you yeah. know definitely uh -huh. absolutely this is, this is amazing what I'm hearing um I th there's a question uh about how world events affect your th thinking about the future your future but also the future of the environment that you're in the world the community that you're in let me just uh, put a little bit of context to it. There's been a lot going on in the last several years, especially uh, where I don't think it's been lost on you that we're in the middle of a pandemic. Um, I wonder how that's impacted you. There's a lot that's been happening in uh, the social justice and in the awareness that has come up, um, especially since the killing of George uh, Floyd last year. Um, technology, I think, is really changing everything that we do and it has accelerated in the last uh, couple of years world event that are happening from conversations about climate issues to politics and the political divides um and what's happening uh all over the world in terms of just relationships between nations and uh cultures you know you're and, and what you're doing is you're trying to figure out what you're curious about and act on that and design your life in the middle of all of that that's happening around that. I, um, I and many who are listening are, are, are interested in hearing how all of that plays out uh, in your own thinking about your future and the future of uh, uh, our world. Um, I guess I'll, I'll speak first on this. Um, it's one thing that I kind of noticed about how America functions and that's a lot of history repeats itself with America mm -hmm. and most of the time it's not much of good history that's repeating itself um and so it makes it hard for a lot of other people to do and play their parts and live how they want to live because some people don't know how to act when they have power mm. so um with all of these events and everything going on it's kind of like you know, like how you were saying, um, how do I go about living my everyday life when all this is going on? Because it's like, I want to be this and I want to be here, but so many people are going through something. So how do I help them too? You know, 
And so it's like, you know, I like I say a lot, I've been saying I talk to God because I've actually been battling with that. You know, it's like, you know, I want to be here and I want to be great and I want to be able to show my passion and do all these things. But there's so many people going through turmoil and so many people are going through all this trauma. So it's like, how do I like differentiate the two? How do I keep it even balanced without doing one more than the other? Like, how do I do good without losing my soul, you know? And mm-hmm. so um, I think the thing is on how it's affecting my future is like, what is the world coming? What is the future coming? What is that going to be like? You know, like how they say that, that robots are going to take over the future because people aren't, you know, in their right intelligence or don't have enough knowledge. But it may be, you know, people may have articles, but those things are actually true because people don't have enough resources, you know, within their communities, within the schools, the education systems, um, redlining, within like the grocery stores, the food and everything. And it's a lot of, you see a lot of that in Baltimore City, literally everywhere you go. And so I think how it affects me is that how can I play a part? It's not that I'm not worried about keeping my passion because that's always going to be there. You see people still doing their fashion shows, NBA and NFL still going. So that's always going to be there. But it's what can I do to take time out to help other people? How can I help bring those resources about um, to put other people in a position where they can, you know, be okay? Or how can I give my input to the people in power and say, you need to make a change because you're obviously not doing something right. Um, And it's a lot of in English class where we've actually had this discussion on like, what are we, um, you know, what are we, what are we focused on? Like, what do we, what are we passionate about outside of our career? And, you know, we're talking a lot about um, how COVID has affected us and everything. And, you know, I thought that COVID was going to be a sit down for a lot of people. Like, you need to sit down and figure this out. Like, we need to sit down on how to make this better. And really, it seemed like nothing is changing. Like, it seems like everybody's in the same place as far as like the people in power. And so it's like, how do I go about reaching out to these people or how do I, how am I supposed to tell these people like you need to change? Because again, like I was saying, history repeats itself. So people are doing protests. Like people are saying that we need help. Like we need the government and everything. But if nobody is playing their, you know, if nobody's playing that part, it brings a lot of questions about can we really trust you and your system? And so it's not that, you know, I, it's not that it's not affecting my future, but it actually brings me to have more questions and curiosity to question the people who are kind of like, seem like they have a hope on our future, kind of, you know? Mm-hmm. I think in a way, Shadi, I kind of echo you. Um, it's kind of made me think about how I can use my my innate gifts, the things that I'm honing to help others. Um you know, like social media is a big part of that for me um, because I've been growing that for a while. And I'm like, okay, you know, we're all kind of worried about getting sick and being sick and um, having family members who have gone through a lot. So that makes me want to work out even more, show people that it's attainable. Um, That makes me want to sing from my heart, not just to make money, you know, Mm -hmm. because I really do feel like music has the power to change minds. I know that sounds so cliche, but you know, every time I sing for people, I can tell that I've touched them because it came from somewhere. Like you said, um, I, I pray to God as well. So I'm like, before I perform, I'm always like, just let this touch somebody. Just let this change someone's mind. Someone who had a cold heart before they came in here, they couldn't forgive someone. Let this change their mind. So it, with COVID and everything in the world that's going on that will continue to go on probably for as long as humans exist, um, we can always change it to think about how I can be a gift. How can I help those immediately around me? Sometimes we're always trying to reach out far. Let me help that person way across the street. But you you have friends, family members, uh, co- colleagues and peers who might need you. You know, so sometimes I try to, you know, each one teach one, pay it forward, you know, because really it does do that, that chain effect. You You change somebody, they change somebody. Mm-hmm. You know, so I think sometimes we can bring it in a little bit because when we start thinking about the whole world, like, well, how can I change the whole world? And you can kind of get in that space. And yeah. it's like, let me start right here, right now with this, with you, you know? If, Alex, yeah. if you don't mind, before you say something, I just want to piggyback off of it real quick. Yeah, um, you know, this 
Amber, what you're saying is like, it's, it's, it's touching me a lot because one, my aunt is a singer. Mm. So she's been singing in the church since she was, I don't know how long, like since she was like four. And so when I see her sing praise and worship now, like you see the power that singing actually has. And it has a lot of power over people. And I don't under- think people understand how powerful music is. Yeah. Um, and so when she sings, like, and then you look at the crowd, it's just like, everybody's just pouring themselves out, you know, feeling like the song, feeling the music because they can relate to it. And just like, you know, you're going through a tough time, but this song is saying that you can get through it. You know, like you have Jason Nelson or the Kirk Franklin telling you to put a smile on your face, you know, and it's, yeah. all, it's all of these things. And it's just like, music has uh, is a powerful gift you know and it's also like you were saying like starting within your circle um Mm -hmm. and like I didn't notice it until you know not even COVID but before is that when you don't we reach out more outside than we do on the inside Mm -hmm. and so it's just like you know you have to start with the inside my mom is always telling me it like she sends me um she sends me a quote every day um, or sends me like something inspirational or tells me to listen to this because she knows I'm going through something and they can help my spirit and bring me into a positive, you know, more enlightenment. And mm-hmm. so, you know, when you start with the inside, you really don't understand how much you're changing those people, you know, mm-hmm. like my little brother, he, he's always trying to help somebody. So he's always trying to reach out to somebody. So he told me that he touched one person. And then they want to share it to their Instagram and other people were reaching out to him saying like, yo, this really touched me. And then that dude went back to him and was like, man, I appreciate you. And it's just, it's always like the little things can always help and touch somebody, you know? And it's like, also like we're giving information, like you were saying and spreading all this out because you start with the inside. Clubhouse is like an, probably one of the best things that could have been created during COVID because it's so much information being spread from the room, the enlightenment, the enlightenment rooms and to talking about real estate, to talking about Airbnbs, like people like just literally in there, you you literally get all the information that you could think of without having to go to Google. I hear my mom on it all the time. I'm like, you've been on Clubhouse all day. Like, <laughs> you know, get out. But she has like pages and pages of paper because she's being enlightened on information that she was never taught, you know? Mm-hmm. So that, that uh-huh. was just my point on piggybacking. Yeah. And I I think that's a great segue to how I think about it, which is um, there are, yeah, there are definitely huge challenges Um, in the past, you know, three, two, three years specifically um, globally have been tumultuous, you know, like, and, and um, I want to start off by saying I am personally, I'm in a very privileged position. You know, I'm a, I'm a white guy. I go to a very good school, you know, like I, um, but I don't think that there's a better time to ever be alive, you know, in the history of the world than right now. Right. Like that's, that's kind of how I, um, how I view it is with genuine optimism. Um, and there's a book, uh, and maybe this was shaped by this, but when I was a senior in high school, I read a book called enlightenment now, which, uh, was, it's, it's basically, the case for why right now is, um, you know, bar none, the best time to ever be alive. And uh, specifically, um, like you, uh, both Amber and Sade, like, I am really interested in how uh, I can play a part in helping to solve some of the the greatest challenges that, um, you know, face our generation. And uh, I am super bullish and optimistic about, um, I don't know the energy of our generation and and our ability to actually uh, make a tangible impact and solve some of these problems. Um, and so for me, I think, I, I mean, I think it's definitely tough, you know, navigating um, such a, you know, changing world, uh, you know, like things change, especially with like Farouk was saying, kind of the, the rate technology is advancing web three, you know, I'm kind of like deep in that um, ecosystem right now, but I am. Uh, I'm really excited. I, I think. I think there's a lot of really cool stuff going on, and um, like I, I really don't think there would be a better time if I could choose any other time to be born in history. Right now, you know, right now is the time. So uh, yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm super bullish. I, I love that optimism, and I, uh, you know, as as an academic and an educator, 
Um, I don't want to miss the opportunity to get your thoughts about what uh, colleges and universities could do different and better as uh, just to paint the context there as monsters of tradition. We're, in, we're institutions of tradition and um, um, we're, we're due for disruption. And all three of you are experiencing your college experience through your own different lenses. So you have things to say about it based on everything that you just shared in this hour. Um, so enlighten to us a little bit and tell us like what, what we need to do different, what we need to keep doing, uh, what needs to change based on um, uh, your own experiences. Well, I think in a way this vision chat is a big step forward and I wish that uh, more, uh, I saw more of this <laughs> when I was in undergrad because I think that would have um, really um, inspired me when teachers were telling me I wasn't going to get into grad schools. And, you know, it really would have um, helped me get out of some of those holes that I was in during the time. Um, but I think that what we should keep doing is um, keep inspiring students to be curious through, you know, taking different opportunities, letting them know that sometimes uh, what can really help you is on the other side of fear. So sometimes if you look at what makes me scared, what, what, what is something that I really don't want to do? But I, and then you'll realize it is something that I actually want to do. I'm just afraid that I'll fail at it. And so then you'll realize, okay, I need to do that thing anyway. And, you know, I think that was the thing for me because I did think I was going to fail and not get, get into any grad school. So I auditioned for nine of them and got into seven. So I'm like, okay, I really did waste a lot of resources thinking, you know, letting somebody else put that fear in me about my own life. And so I think, you know, I wish in a way that that teacher hadn't done that, um, hadn't put me in that mind space, hadn't um, been such an idealist, such so traditional during that time. And so I think, you know, teachers need to realize it's individual, you know, this, it, this path that we're on is individual. So I know you had a path and I know that it worked because you're here in front of me, but don't discourage me from trying something different than what you did. Don't automatically think it's going to fail because that's not how you did it. Um, I think that's the culture a lot of the times when you're talking to professors. Um, to piggyback off of Amber, um, I think one thing that a lot of teachers or education professors do is that they take this stereotype that they have about one person and apply it to the whole class. Mm -hmm. um, or not even just the whole class to the entire section or if you're freshman, sophomore, senior or whatever, just because of their experiences. And so a lot of times people tend to take their experiences that they've been through and mm -hmm. put it on to you and who you are, just because like you were saying, their tradition on what their thought is and what their process is. And mm -hmm. so it will help a lot if teachers would not do that. So don't like put your experience on somebody else. Don't put your stereotype and your thought pattern on somebody else just because I'm not doing the norm, you know? And mm -hmm. so also it's kind of like, you know, people don't, people only pinpoint on what they're used to. So like, you know, a lot of people are in, um, a lot of people are getting their doctors. A lot of people want to be nurses or a lot of people want to be in the medical or technology field, but people don't think outside of that. So like being artists, you know, people don't think, um, people don't pick, piggyback off of that. People don't, mm -hmm you know, try to give you um, any encouragement because they're like, what are you going to, it's like when people say as an artist, how are you going to make money by selling a painting? How are you going to make money by singing on the stage in front of a couple of people? How are you going to make money by making an act that you feel supposed to encourage other people? So when people are not used to what you do, they're just like, that's not going to work. And then so it kind of brings you down, especially if you're a first timer, because you're just like, man, I thought my idea was going to work. I thought I could take it somewhere. But then you're just like, no, my idea is going to work. You're just not used to what I'm doing because I'm trying to decide to take a different route. Like Amber, you were saying, excuse me, um, like how you weren't the norm. Like, you know, how Black people are. We like to be a little hip with how we dress and <laughs> a little hip with like in our earrings and our style. And so people aren't used to that because you're changing the norm. And so it's kind of like me, if people aren't used to, you know, the way that photography is normally supposed to be, then they're just like, mm, that's, I don't like that. But it's just like, no, I know what I'm doing and I know what's going to impact somebody else. I know what's going to 
do something for somebody else and say, oh, that person can do it. So I'm going to do it too. Or another thing that I see like a lot of people do is that because you're younger, people don't think that you have the same capabilities that they have. But really, sometimes you know more than what they know or you can do more than what they do. And so I have went through it a couple of times where people are just like, you know, I'm offering that I can do this. But then they're just like, mm, I don't think you're capable. I don't think you have enough knowledge and skill to be able to make this happen. And you're telling them, I know what my capabilities are. I know what I'm capable of. And I know that I can make this outcome. I know that I can make this happen. But they're still like, you know, no, this this just isn't worth We'd rather have a professional professional but that's what the beauty of trial and error is is that i'm supposed to learn so why not give me the opportunity to start with you to learn more and i when i went there one experience I, it kind of hurt because it was just like like i called my mom crying and i'm like they don't believe in me like what am i supposed to do because i know that i can do this but they won't give me a chance and she's just like like amber you were saying not everybody is accepting of your gift not everybody is going to you know take on what you want to do not everybody is going to be like okay we'll take you on we'll give you a chance because not everybody is accepting of new chance not everybody is accepting of trial and error and i I feel like if people put more trust in minorities then they will understand that you know having that balance of you know the elderly or the people who are more experienced versus the people who are younger with even more experience that's a great combination because now you have both worlds but people don't see that. So not being judgmental, not trying to force your stereotype thoughts on others, not trying to pinpoint people to what your thought pattern is, not making people feel any lower than themselves than they already feel like, because also you don't know what people are going on outside of school. You know, a lot of people are in college. A lot of people are depressed. Like a lot of people don't have family. A lot of people like, you know, classes just alone, like, trying to submit assignments due by 1159 because you forgot to do it the day before or just like you know just anything falling in that area and people don't understand that it's so much more to just me being in the class and you feeling like I'm not meeting your expectations so I'm just going to fail it doesn't work like that I just want to let you know that people are going to think you're crazy until it works you know (laughs) when I finally emailed them oh hey you know, I, I emailed everybody, everybody mm-hmm. who told me I wasn't going to make it, everybody who told me I wasn't going to get into any grad schools. I was like, hey, I have this gig coming up on PBS. And they're like, <laughs> what? you know, so it's like, you know, they're going to think you're crazy. They're like, Mm-mm, it's just not going to it's not going to work. And then when it does, you'll see that they're all hop back on the wagon, mm-hmm. you know, and, you, and that just shows, you know. Um, but like I said, I give people grace. I don't fault them for that. You know, mm-hmm. because if she if she hadn't told me that I wouldn't have this amazing testimony of saying, hey, I actually did make it. And you never know what small black girl might have got told that same that same thing. And it's like, oh, but I know that that girl, Amber, she mm-mm, she got mm-hmm. into seven out of nine. So I know it's possible for me. So, mm-hmm. you know, these little testimonies that we have, you know, it's actually needed. It really is. Yeah, mm-hmm. I, I couldn't agree more. Um, Amber, and that's a great. Well, my my answer to you Farouk was that um education I think as a whole needs to become uh more accessible to more people uh you know and like and what I mean by that is is more so that there needs to be better pathways um for people who don't go to Johns Hopkins or a top 10 university or don't go to college at all you know like um I think that um uh, I've been really kind of curious on the, the high school to college to workforce transition. And uh, there's a, I'm going to throw out one more book, which is The Tyranny of Merit, um, which is, uh, it's a book about kind of the, the, the core uh, tenant in our society, um, which is like, to be successful, you need to uh, get a great education. And I think that that's true. Uh, you, you definitely need to get a great education. But what uh, the flip side of the coin is that like, if you if you don't, then you're not successful, right? And I think what there needs to be is more pathways for people uh, from all sorts of different um, situations, backgrounds, circumstances, um, even within you know at Hopkins. I think there there needs to be more um, pathways and customizations to uh, the needs of specific kind of people and their interests. And uh, so Amber, like you're saying, like. Uh, you know, there needs to be more stories of people, um, you know, that came from where you came from that look like you, um, that show you what's possible. And, uh, and, and ultimately, that's my, um, 
that's one of my biggest passions. Oh, Danielle's saying, repeat the title of the book. It's called The Tyranny of Merit. Um, but that's my biggest, that's my biggest passion. And uh, that's what I'm working on at my startup called Paths, which is uh, a social network um, to learn about and share different life stories and experiences through audio snippets. So uh, Shade, you know, you love Clubhouse. This is audio. You know, you might, you might want to check this out and, uh, and share a little bit about, about your story because I think it would be inspiring for, um, for someone else. Uh, so, so yeah. Alex, I, I need your book list. You keep throwing out like, please. Uh, please. <laughs> I'm like, you know, if you just want to shoot that email so fast. Okay. I'm like, oh my God. Um, so send it to I, me and I'll include it for the recording. How is that? When we send yeah. the recording, we'll include it. I can't, you know, the thing is, I can't take credit for any of these ideas. It's just, uh, <laughs> it's just repurposing them. <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's the whole point about being curious and acting on it and then being inspired is that it, you don't really complete the circle unless you share, unless you start to make it about other people, unless you give back. That's and that and that um, not only helps others, but it helps you also elevate your game to a whole other level. Um, Denise on the chat asked, as uh, we'll make this our last question to wrap it up. Uh, where do you all get your maturity and your grounding from? Because the question is, are all students like this? Uh, and those who are not, how you know, where do they get it from? Uh, where does this come from? Because it's quite inspiring to hear what, what we just heard. And we want to know how we get it to everybody. I, I guess I can start off because I think um, fundamentally uh, tied into what I just said is that I really believe in the potential of every single person to, uh, you know, that I believe it's infinite, you know, like I, I, I think that there's so much potential in every single, any, every student, every person, I think it's vastly um, underestimated. And uh, so I think, you know, one thing is just to, to get to know um, just to like be curious about other people and get to know them and, you know, genuinely ask about them and, and their experiences and, and there, yeah, there's going to be some students who have it a little less figured out, but like, uh, you, you know, it's like a cycle of, um, oh yeah, you know, I, I think this is my, you know, path and then, you know, trying to figure it out again. And, and, um, and so I think it, uh, I think that if you just get to know students and, um, and talk to them and, uh, you know, just take interest in, in helping them ideate, helping them do their own life design process, like they're going to surprise you. Um, uh, some, some, you know, I think like, so my little sister is, uh, is a freshman. Uh, she just started, uh, her freshman year at, uh, Loyola Marymount in California. And, um, it reminds me back to when I was a freshman and like, you know, just trying to figure everything out. And, um, and, you know, sometimes you need a little more handholding. So, so you know, I'll call her like every week, but, um, I really believe like it, it, just the growth that from freshman to senior year that, um, you see a lot of students take and what I'm thinking that she's going to go through is, uh, is inspiring. And it's proof of like really the, the untapped potential in everyone. Um, and so sometimes I just think it needs to be nurtured a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'll add on to what you were saying, Alex. Um, I do think it's uh, more about nurturing um, because, you know, a lot of people that what I've learned is that, you know, everybody, has a stage of maturity that they have to reach. Some reach it more faster than others, and some are still trying to find their way to that point. Um, a lot of people, it takes more time to learn and go through that process. Um, but I feel like that's also because of this phrase that I learned in English, um, it's who you know is what you know. So like your social capital and the people who are in your community, like from your household, even to you know your neighborhood or in school, if nobody is teaching you how to build yourself up as a man or as a woman, or based on like whatever so, um, community that you're in, or how, however you plan to grow up, if nobody's teaching you that, you're only learning that all on your own. Nobody is helping you on how to, you know, how to have um, these manners, how to, um, how to act when you're around certain people. What what phrases to speak or how you should speak in different um, areas or in communities versus in your business, if you're in business or you're in school or if you're around your friends. You know, nobody has 
a lot of people don't have somebody to teach them that. So like you were saying, Alex, if you nurture them and you talk to them and say, hey, I understand that, you know, you may not be at this certain level, but I want to help you get there. So what is it that you're missing out on that I can pour more into you and tell you and help you get to that point that you're trying to reach? Because I've I seen it happen in high school with this guy who everybody figured was the class clown. But when I sat and talked to him, I'm like, this man really knows his stuff. He might be joking around a lot in class, but he really knows some stuff. And it's because, you know, people only see you one way that they don't think there's more to you outside of what they see, you know? So it, it makes things a lot more harder. And, and a lot of teachers do that too. They think that because of what you they see in the classroom, you don't, you're not more, you don't have any more knowledge out of what they already expect. So if you, it's a lot of people where if you really sit down and talk to them and really try to get to know them, you'll see that it's way more to them than what you think. And as far as maturity, a lot of people just need that, you know, that mentorship. They need that help because a lot of people may not get it, get it in their households. You know, you don't always have teachers who are willing to just sit down and talk and, you know, do more outside of the classroom rather than just get paid and go home to their kids, you know? And so when you don't have that, it makes a wide range of gap of, you know, you saying, you know, um, students or adults who are more mature as, at a certain age versus people who are at that same age, but not as mature, you know? And so people think that, you know, there's no help. They, you can't take them anywhere because they don't listen to anything, but it's really, they want help, but they don't have nobody, you know? And when you don't have nobody and you're trying to figure out all out on your own, it can get very discouraging. So it seems like, your whatever people think of you it kind of seems like that because of the way you're portraying but people don't know on the inside you're really crying out for help but a lot of people our age you know we don't cry for help because we think we only have to do it on our own because we feel like nobody else is there to help us so nurturing goes a very very long way as far as like um maturity and reaching out to people and trying to make them be better because a lot of people need it and I'm thankful that I actually have a mom who does it with me so much because if she didn't I I would not be talking the way that I am right now or acting high end because when you don't have somebody there you literally are all alone and that's why so many people are in the dark closets or you know listening to all this music that makes them feel you know, it doesn't add, it adds on to their pain instead of taking away their pain, if you understand what I'm saying. So like with rap music, a lot of people listen to Broadway Wave or you got, you know, this a rapping in Young Boy or all these people. And it, add, <laughs> every note, so it adds on, they're adding on to their pain and they're like, I can relate to this. But it's like, no, you need to listen to something that's going to, you need to listen to something that's going to make you feel better. Like, man, I know I'm in this position, but I really need to better myself, mm -hmm. you know? And so whether that, and, you know, mentoring doesn't only just come through a person that comes through a book, you know, like Alex, or it comes through pouring into a profession or a passion, or it comes, it can come through music. It can come through writing. Mentorship doesn't always have to come through somebody else. It comes through, it, it comes in many different ways. And I know because when I started journaling, Write, or writing letters to God, I found it out. When I started reading more, I found it out. When I started just pouring into different passions, it's not that you're being your own mentor, but you're pouring into things that's pouring into you. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. I think it's an important point that you made, Shadi, is that you know, your mom has been that cornerstone for you. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that's a big thing for me too, is that my parents have been that. My dad texts me every morning, you are the superstar of the entire world. So that's the first thing that I see when I wake up in the morning. So I might not be feeling like that that day. Um, but that's the first thing I see. And, you know, my mom is always just, even before this call, she's like, you're going to do great, you know? So I'm still I'm 24 years old and still getting, you know, both of my parents in my ear. And, you know, I think, you know, we're always asking teachers, how can they be better? We need you to be better. And, I, you know, teachers can only do so much. You know, it's a hard job. That's That's a very difficult task. Um, but I think that, you know, if you do get a moment to have that individual interaction with students, because there's so many people that they're coming across every single day. Um, but if you do see that one student that's that's trying, but they may be a little bit more shy, more timid to really just, you know, reach out and, and to um, dig in, talk to them. That's what my teacher did for me once I got here. Um, my teacher at Michigan is the total different teacher that I that I've had when I was an undergrad and she embraces every single possibility of me. 
the exercise portion, the I want to do holistic medicine, I want to do r and B. I I want to do jazz, I want to be my own audio engineer, or maybe I'll do some opera on the side, <laughs> you know, like she embraces all of those sides of me, you know, and I think that's just so important that teachers do that because she's made a, a big difference in how I think about myself and how I view my, my gift. One more point before you close out, just real quick, um, I'm not going to be long. No problem, real quick, so we can wrap it up. Okay. Um. One, I didn't know that y'all were so much older than me. I'm only 20, so I thought y'all were like 20, but y'all standing 24. <laughs> but um, the thing I'm is, 21. like, porn- I'm 21. Oh, okay. All right. Well, I don't feel so bad. <laughs> there you go. I'm the only one who should feel bad in this crowd. <laughs> <laughs> but we are my are only, all good. My only thing is that um, Amber, like you were saying, um, pouring into somebody, like accepting them in every single way. Because a lot of people I know this, they only accept you for the part that they want to accept. They don't want to take on everything else. Like they don't want to take on like when you're going through troubles. They don't want to take on when you need help with, you know, different assignments, when you need help with getting this passion done, when you need help with getting more information. Like they don't want to take on every part of you. It's kind of like a relationship, you know, like people say it's supposed to be 50 50, but really it's supposed to be 100 100 because I'm giving my everything and you're giving your everything. So we taking on what each other needs. And it's like with your parents, like you were saying, Amber, when they take on every part of you, it makes you feel whole, it yeah. makes you feel secure because it's like, yeah. okay, well, they don't only just want me for one part, they want me for all of me. They want to love all of me, you know? It's mm-hmm. also like with God too, he's just like, I want to love all of you. I don't want just one part. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I need you to pour everything out. And so, I feel like that was a very key part that you made because when somebody doesn't accept one all of you and they only accept one part, it kind of makes you feel down on yourself too. So, I love it. I love it. This is actually these are perfect words to uh, end this special vision chat. Um, I will tell you that um, I've uh, had many guests on vision chats: uh, college presidents, CEOs, politicians, you know, nonprofit uh, uh, leaders. All have been fantastic. This has been my favorite vision chats of all time. You three are so special and so amazing. I'm just literally blown away. And I haven't had to say much if you notice because you said it all. So, uh, and I think this is probably everybody else's favorites. You three (laughs) are just mind blowing, amazing. And you are going to succeed at whatever you choose. Uh, It's only fitting that we had three artists in this vision sets and we're hosting it from the George Peabody Library at our Peabody uh, Conservatory. And um, uh, I would love to have one of you, Amber Merritt, take us out with a a quick performance if you can. Um, And as you do that, I want to remind everyone that the only vision that matters is the one that you create. Thank you so much for joining us. Take us out, Amber. I ask you this. Which way to go? I ask you this. Which sea to bear? Which crumb to put upon my head? I do not know, Lord God, I do not know.